Good evening. I'm Kelda Yoon. Apologies for the technical difficulties. We have shocking video tonight of a truck being stolen from a driveway in Brampton. It's just another example of the auto theft crisis we're currently facing here in the GTA, which has officials looking across the border for ideas on how to tackle the problem. Del Manukduk has this story. <laughs> Video circulating social media shows car thieves in Brampton backing a truck out of a driveway. It happened last week around 5 in the morning, the thieves ramming the pickup into another car parked behind it in order to get free. Within 30 seconds, the family in the home race out screaming. Some of them chase on foot as the thieves speed off. I have seen that video and I have to tell you, it's... Uh... You know, much like some of the other things that we've experienced in this space, it, it's more evidence of why this is such a concerning issue for our community. Like these things are happening daily. In Peel region, 17 cars are stolen per day. That's down from last year when 23 cars were stolen every day. Overall in the province, insurance claims have skyrocketed over the last few years. In Ontario from 2018 to 2023, uh, it has increased 524%. The Insurance Bureau of Canada says in 2023, over $1.5 billion in insurance claims was paid out Canada-wide. Ontario is definitely the hotspot when you consider that of the $1.5 billion uh, nationally paid out in auto theft claims. One billion dollars of that was in Ontario alone. We don't need a search warrant when we're in the functional of the border, so we're able to open the containers. Meanwhile, Brampton Mayor Patrick Brown visited the port of Newark to see how they're dealing with auto theft. What I saw was very impressive. They got scanners which measure the density of uh, the shipping containers, so they can immediately tell if there are goods that uh, don't match the description. They also have complete um, communication with local law enforcement. And lastly, what they have in the United States is a requirement that for shipping containers, you have to state what is inside them 72 hours in advance. In Canada, the contents of a shipping container can be amended for up to 90 days after being exported. Last month, as part of Canada's national plan to combat auto theft, the federal government announced it's investing in new technologies. On an individual level, measures are getting more extreme. Some people are installing bollards at the end of their driveways to deter potential thieves. Business for Ontario bollards is booming. From the ones we've installed, pretty effective. Uh, we find most thieves end up just going up to the next house. As for the theft from last week, Peel police say the investigation is ongoing and they're looking for five suspects. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. We have new details tonight on the sexual assault charges against billionaire businessman Frank Stronach. The 91-year-old founded the auto parts giant Magna International. And he's now facing charges for allegedly assaulting three different women. Lorenda Redekop has more on what we're learning from court documents. Frank Stronach faces five charges, and there are three different alleged victims, all of them women. These allegations span over decades, from 1980 to just last year. Stronach is now 91 years old, so that most recent allegation is from when he was 90. I'll take you back to the earliest charges. Those go back to July 1980. There are two different charges, both connected to the same female alleged victim, rape and indecent assault. This is going back so far that those don't even exist anymore as offenses. The criminal code changed in 1983. Rape, for example, now falls under sexual assault. The second series of charges is from February 1986. It's another alleged female victim. One charge of sexual assault, one of unlawful confinement. Then the most recent, it's from April of 2023. It's alleged to have happened in Aurora. It's a third alleged victim with one charge of sexual assault. Court documents list Stronach's current address as being in Aurora. Stronach is a well-known, successful businessman. He started Magna International. The company says in a statement that he's had no affiliation with them since he gave up control back in 2010. He's also a member of the Order of Canada. He holds multiple honorary degrees from different institutions. One of them, Laurentian University, says it's monitoring developments. He's also a member of the Automotive Hall of Fame. 
It also says that it's monitoring what happens. For his bail conditions, Stronach had to give up his passport and also can't contact any of the three accused. His lawyer, Brian Greenspan, told CBC last week when news of these charges first came out that his client categorically denies the allegations and looks forward to fully responding to these charges and maintaining his legacy. Stronach will be back in court on July 8th. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. A group gathered in the village tonight to remember a prominent activist for 2S LGBTQ plus rights who died by suicide four years ago. Sarah Hagazi was imprisoned and tortured in her native Egypt for being gay. She later sought asylum in Canada, dedicating herself to helping others targeted for their sexual orientation and political beliefs. Tyler Cheese was at Barbara Hall Park where she was remembered tonight. She was so kind. She would talk to me and tell me, Ahmed, be patient, don't give up. One day we'll go to Canada and be safe and can be yourself. In the village at Church in Wellesley, this mural stands as a memorial to queer activist Sara Hagazi. It's here that friends and admirers have gathered to remember her on the fourth anniversary of her death. To see this community all coming together to celebrate Sara and still have her vital fighter soul inside us it's so meaningful it tell us that sarah even after she passed away she built this community who are still fight for others and advocate as she did Higazi was imprisoned in the fall of 2017 after waving a rainbow flag at a concert in cairo she later sought asylum in canada in a CBC News interview in 2018, she spoke of the enduring trauma of her imprisonment, which she said included torture by electric shock. Though she made a home in Toronto, she desperately missed her family. I was not anyone here, just alone, completely alone. Higazi died by suicide on June 13, 2020, but her legacy is remembered today. She was incredibly brave, incredibly... Um, like she was soft spoken, but the things that she did write and the things that she did say and the ways she showed up for people are something that I will never forget. Others say Hagazi's story is just one example that 2S LGBTQ plus newcomers face when they arrive to Canada. She, like many newcomers, um, um, was faced by systemic uh, issues uh, fitting into um, the communities here, even uh, finding um, um, uh, safe haven uh, in Canada, but uh, not uh, much uh, connection with different communities. If there are minorities inside minorities, uh, like uh, queer and trans people inside the newcomer and immigrant uh, communities, uh, that adds uh, more layers of um, of, uh, of of challenges uh, to uh, to that specific demographic. The group says they also want to honor Hagazi by following in her footsteps. By going on to continue to do the work that she fought for, um, fighting for the rights of people like her who are still being persecuted. She says Hagazi wanted the world to be a little freer and better for everyone. Tyler Cheese, CBC News, Toronto. A Toronto community housing tenant is fighting back after parts of his ceiling were lowered to less than seven feet. That's below provincial regulations. TCHC says it's to accommodate a new heat pump system, but the tenant says it's making his unit almost unlivable. Chris Glover has his story. I, I love this building. I love this neighborhood. I love the community. Every time Robbie James walks into his TCHC apartment lately, He's incensed. It's been terrible on my mental health, living there in a state of construction with ceiling heights so low, it's very dark. It has the atmosphere of a basement boiler room. This is what's fueling his rage. In a section of his living room to fit a new heat pump, his ceiling has been lowered to less than seven feet. Provincial building regulations say ceilings can't be lower than about seven and a half feet. It's extremely claustrophobic. The moment that the work began, I was so shocked that I was immediately asking how it could possibly be legal that this could be done. His Asquith Avenue building near Bloor and Young is the third TCHC building to have the new energy efficient heat pumps installed. The city confirms to CBC Toronto, TCHC got special permission for the lower ceilings due to the requirement for the HVAC upgrade. 
there's just a real sense that we've been completely taken advantage of and abused by Toronto Community Housing Corporation. In a statement to CBC Toronto, TCHC wrote the benefits of the new HVAC system at 40 Asquith for both energy efficiency and tenant comfort outweigh the slight deviation from the Ontario Building Code requirements for ceiling heights. If you got authorization from the city to lower a ceiling, then technically there's nothing that's illegal there. Cities are allowed to set their own bylaws. While it's not illegal, one tenant advocate says there should have been consultation with residents. And it seemed to say that they were weighing the balances between, um, you know, tenant desires, but it seems like they didn't actually talk to any tenants. He also says there's an argument to be made that the change affects the tenant's right to reasonable enjoyment of the unit. And even if appeals to the city are refused, tenants have other options, though they are unlikely as well. They can also go to the courts and ask the courts to remedy that, but uh, the way the courts are backed up right now, it can be a quite a long time before you can try to get some justice there. I think that the city's own housing corporation should promise to always maintain our tenants' ceiling height rights. This is a vitally important thing, and this could last for generations. We don't want generations of Torontonians to be living in apartments that are already so small and are now encroaching on our heights as well. Despite his opposition, TCHC says it is forging ahead. The remaining units will get upgraded with the new heat pumps by the end of the year. Chris Glover, CBC News, Toronto. There's a development in the largest gold heist in Canadian history. Now, last spring, police say $20 million in gold bars and cash were loaded onto a truck near Toronto's Pearson Airport, then driven away. Well, now CBC News is learning that one of the suspects still at large is preparing to turn himself in. Katie Nicholson has the latest. It was the largest gold heist in Canadian history, more than $20 million in gold and foreign currency in this five-ton truck, stolen from a cargo facility. One of the first people investigators met was an Air Canada manager who gave them a tour. Simran Preet Panesar later became a suspect. He resigned in the summer of last year, and then uh, we have not been able to locate him since. We, we have an idea, and I can't speak to where we believe he is right now. Two months after police announced charges against him, Panesar has resurfaced. In a statement, Panesar's lawyer Greg LaFontaine says his client is voluntarily returning to Canada in the coming weeks and is anxious to have an opportunity to demonstrate his absolute innocence. He says right now, Panesar is tidying up his affairs abroad, but wouldn't say where. But on Wednesday, Panesar messaged CBC News via a WhatsApp business account connected to an Indian mobile number. Yo. Before he disappeared, Panesar and his wife Preeti made music videos in Canada, like this one. And were apparently trying to break into the Punjabi entertainment industry. Days before the gold heist charges were announced in April, Preeti, who is not a gold heist suspect, posted pictures from a photo shoot in a city in northern Punjab. She tagged people and businesses in her posts, and CBC News contacted them and sent multiple emails to Preeti's official account. That all led up to the WhatsApp message from the suspect on Wednesday. If Panesar returns to Canada, that leaves just one suspect still in the wind, Arsalan Chaudhry. The case is still in its early stages and the investigation is ongoing, but across the border, a U.S. arms trafficking trial involving the alleged wheelman in the gold heist is scheduled to begin in September in Pennsylvania. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Newly released documents show the Ontario government spent almost a million dollars to build a business case for moving the Ontario Science Centre to Toronto's waterfront. The official opposition calls the business case a sham government is willing uh, to spend just about anything to concoct a business case uh, for something that they've already decided to do, which is to build this luxury uh, private spa in downtown Toronto at enormous expense to taxpayers already, uh, and just to satisfy, I don't know, a few insiders. The new details were obtained through a freedom of information request by the Canadian press. Critics are calling the business report a cover for the government's deal with European company Therma to build a private spa on what is now public land. The report concluded that relocating the Science Centre from its current location in East Toronto to Ontario Place on the city's waterfront would save about $250 million over 50 years. Savings that are largely because the new building would be half the size. 
Welcome back. Well, Sunday is Father's Day, and there are many ways to celebrate fathers and father figures this weekend. Talia Ricci has more on some of the things happening across our city. There's lots happening for Father's Day all across the GTA, but if you're looking for something to do with your dad, you might want to start here at Young Dundas Square. Metal. The busiest crossroads in the whole of Canada. We have an amazing lineup of buskers and a set of giant games for everyone to play. Everything that we do on the square is free. We never charge admission. It's very easy to get to us by TTC and other methods. Come and enjoy the square, free of charge. My show is basically 30 minutes of dad jokes and danger, so there's nothing better on Father's Day weekend than come down and check out that show. After your visit to Young Dundas Square, you could head right next door to Little Canada, where you could see miniature versions of all of your favorite spots in the GTA. So Little Canada is a unique and one-of-a-kind experience telling the story of Canada through the art of miniature. And what's really exciting about Father's Day is that it allows visitors to come in and hear those stories, see those stories, but more importantly, it allows them to share stories amongst themselves, prompted by what they have seen. They can also commemorate those moments by getting littleized. And I have a father and son here. We're going to place them in the world where they asked us to put them. Feeling a little more in the mood to dabble in some Italian culture, music, and food, then you can make your way to Little Italy this weekend. We've been putting on Taste of Little Italy for over 20 years, and I think that this year's uh, coming out to be one of the best that we've had yet. It uh, takes place on Father's Day every year, so it's a great choice to bring uh, Dad down. Uh, this year, there's the added bonus of uh, Euro Cup uh, kicking off on the same weekend. So uh, you could uh, come down and watch, uh, catch the match on Saturday or any of the matches all week, weekend long. We have just about everything Italian from pizza to pasta to our very own spaducci. We have uh, arancini. We have about, just about anything Italian you have to offer and more. Still hungry? You could always head down to Rib Fest at Woodbine Park and then take a short walk down to the beach. Every year we come here, it's Father's Day weekend and it is just packed full of people. We got the five rib teams here uh, that'll be cooking uh, from morning till late night and overnight sometimes uh, to get ready for the big day. A bunch of great bands, a bunch of other great vendors, uh, funnel cakes, um, blooming onions, all that kind of good stuff that people want. Centerville, the Toronto Islands is celebrating fathers by offering them an all day ride pass and the Jays play at the Rogers Centre on Sunday. Day. There's also no shortage of diverse restaurants to take dad to, but of course there's always the option of skipping the crowds and traffic and letting dad rest. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. That's what's so great about the city, right, Colette? There's always so much to do. And tomorrow there's also a race that's going to be happening across the wa waterfront. Yeah, that's right. We've got the 10K race yeah. tomorrow morning. So I thought we'd take a look at the <laughs> forecast for that. And I'll tell you, it's looking pretty good uh, for runners here. We're talking about 730 is when it gets off. Uh, 14 degrees for that temperature, bright sky, certainly very slim rain chance. We should have dry conditions, but you know, um, the runners have till about 9.45, I think, to come in, but it's at 9.45 that they have a kids race going on too. It's 800 meters, kids two to 10. Yeah, I think it starts <laughs> with two-year-olds. And by then, uh, you know, maybe give give the baby a sun, uh, sunglasses because the temperature is 17 degrees, a lot of sun glare uh, as that sun gets brighter through the day. But uh, some really nice conditions for that before we get to Sunday and Father's Day. Uh, highs from earlier today, looking at those readings, a lot of them in the mid-20s or just above for Windsor, just a little below there uh, towards Barry, closer to at 20 degrees, in fact. So as we look ahead in terms of what's to come, yes, we have high pressure that's been building in. It's going to protect us and keep things comfortable for another day. In fact, tomorrow's gonna be a little bit cooler than today, 
But as soon as Sunday, we'll begin the climb. It's not till we get into Monday, though, that we'll really find those dew points rising and the stickiness of the atmosphere becoming very apparent. Now, for Saturday, as we go into the evening hours, we'll pick up a little bit of cloud cover. So on Sunday, yes, there's quite a bit of cloud cover in the early morning. But then by afternoon, we get into clearer conditions. So I kind of put up partly cloudy on the icon because it's going to be variable through the day. Now, there will be those shower to the north late evening Sunday could have some of these kind of coming through that would be after your barbecue time with dad uh, but into cottage country and then overnight Sunday into Monday we may see a few of those showers then making their way into the GTA but the timing as it is right now looks really good that it's in those overnight hours and then into uh, Monday morning. The temperatures for tonight, we are looking at our readings really comfortable 12 degrees for Toronto 13 for Oshawa. 11 for Barrie, and then uh, Windsor, 13 for you for tonight. Tomorrow, 21 degrees with low humidity, really comfortable. Sunday, though, there we go, 27, feeling like 30 or so, and then we get into the 30s, feeling like we're into the 40s as we head into next week. There'll likely be some heat warnings going up. All right, thanks so much, Colette. And that's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Shannon Martin has your next local newscast tomorrow at 6. Have a great weekend, everyone.